ever been associated with or played against her, and I would take Bobby. Bobby Hall was the definition of speed, power, and greatness. His charisma in Chicago captivated the city. And he would barrel down the ice at very high speed and shoot his uh, slap shot at about, a, for almost from the blue line, something right across at about 120 miles an hour. And if it was on target, it either would go in or make an awful thump. If Hull personified natural ability, then Stan Mikita personified endless determination. He relied more on uh, guile and on uh, being a pest. He was known as a, a pesky player. Possessing a unique intelligence of the game, Mikita was the best center of his time. Stan Mikita was a tremendous hockey player. He, you know, for two years, I think he led the league and he had the best defensive record for a centerman, so that speaks for itself. Hall of Fame goalie Glenn Hall ruled the Nets with such skill, he was known simply as Mr. Goalie. Good goalkeepers, Glenn Hall. You gotta have goalkeepers. If you haven't got a goalkeeper, you're dead. <laughs> Add players like Pierre Pallant, Ken Warham, Murray Balfour, and Eric Nestorenko, among others, and you have the makings for a Stanley Cup run in 1961. Well, it wasn't what you'd call a Cinderella team. I mean, we built it gradually. It didn't happen overnight. Facing Detroit in the 61 finals, the Hawks relied on goals by Reg Fleming, Ab McDonald, and Eric Nestorenko in the sixth and deciding game, as well as the flawless goaltending by Glenn Hall to beat the Red Wings. The Hawks hadn't won a final in 23 years, but under head coach Rudy Pillis, the Stanley Cup would return to Chicago. We had players at that, that time I thought worked pretty hard. And I don't say harder than the players are working now, I don't mean it that way, but they seemed to really put everything they had into it. Maybe a little extra too. Some Hawks fans missed the cup more than others, as Andy Frey and Usher Les Modesti discovered when he apprehended a man making his way out of the stadium with the prize trophy. But he didn't get away with it. He got up to the door, and I put my arms on him, took him back in with the cup. And uh, I said, Mr. Woods, give me a check for $100 or something like that. He said, reward, that's your reward. <laughs> Broadcaster Lloyd Pettit enjoyed an unforgettable first year as the voice of the Blackhawks. And in the press box, uh, there was a concrete ceiling about two feet over my head. And I get excited at games. And when the Blackhawks would score with my microphone, I'd jump up and yell a shot in the goal and crack my head on the cement ceiling. The Blackhawks would enjoy continued success throughout the 1960s. A return engagement to the Stanley Cup Finals in 62 matched the Hawks with Toronto. Highlighted by the inspired play of Stan Mikita, who scored two goals in Game 2, the series would not be decided until Game 6 at the stadium. Bobby Hull's lone goal in Game 6 would not be enough, as the Leafs would triumph in the end with a 2-1 victory. I think the most exciting thing about Chicago Stadium uh, was the audience, because they were always jam-packed. It's standing room only 8-10 deep up on top. Under the guidance of head coach Billy Ray, who would become the winningest coach in team history, the Hawks returned to the Stanley Cup Finals against Montreal in 1965. The fans were so great, you know, and the fans had their own favorites. You know, it wasn't always Bobby, it wasn't always Stan. Some fans loved Nestorinko, some fans loved Reggie Fleming, some fans loved Glenn Hall, you know. It, w it was just a great feeling. It was a, a, like a family atmosphere around here. Bobby Hall gave the stadium much reason to roar. Some memorable noise came on a late winter evening in 1966. The wildest night was when uh, Bobby Hull scored his 51st goal. He became the first player to score more than 50 goals. The celebration went on for about 10 minutes. There was absolute pandemonium in Chicago State. Gordon Jett driving at center in on the Ranger defense. Getting sad, he may pass or shoot, he drives one. Tell at that time was as big in hockey possibly 
as Michael Jordan was in basketball till recently. Hall was probably the many ways the most recognizable athlete in Chicago. Despite three Stanley Cups in the team's history, the Hawks had yet to win the Prince of Wales trophy. That long spell was broken on stadium ice in 1967 when the Hawks beat Toronto to clinch first place in the NHL. In 66-67, we broke that hex and finished in first place in the sixth team league, you know, and that was really a great, great season. And who could forget the accomplishments of the 1970 season, when the Blackhawks went from last place a year before to their second Prince of Wales trophy? I think the first time you come in as a rookie is very special to you. You look around and, and you have never been in a building this big. Plus 1969 when we went from last place to first place and we beat Montreal 10 to 2 was uh, very uh, special to all of us as rookies and even as veterans. The arrival of new talent brought the Blackhawks continued success. Uh, Tommy Ivan could have said, well, I want that guy or I want that guy. He, he said Esposito and uh, his first year with the Hawks, he had 15 shutouts. Tony Esposito's command of the Nets made him one of the game's greatest goaltenders. His 15 shutouts in the 1970 season stand as an NHL record and inspired his nickname, Tony Zero. The 1970 season would also see Bobby Hull score his 500th career goal. Fellow legend Stan Mikita would pass the same milestone a few years later. In the 60s, the Hawks were an internationally known team because they had the, these two superstars. But at the time, Hull and Nikita were on the par, let's say, with uh, Rocket, uh, Rocket Richard and Jean Bellegaux and, that's, and Gordie Howe, of course. In 1971, Hull scored goal number 545, surpassing Maurice Richard and placing the Golden Jet second on the all-time list. 1971 would bring the Blackhawks to yet another Stanley Cup Finals. In a classic showdown with Montreal, the Blackhawks dueled the Canadiens to a final seventh game. 20,000 fans in Chicago Stadium to see this final game of perhaps the most exciting and dramatic Stanley Cup playoffs in NHL history. Because of the excitement, the CBS television network preempted its prime time regular programming to carry this game. The Hawks took command with a 2-0 lead behind goals by Dennis Hull and Dan O'Shea, much to the delight of the stadium crowd. But in a dramatic finish, the Canadians dashed the Blackhawks' hope for victory, coming from behind to win 3-2. That was heartbreaking, really, because we were ahead in the, in the get final game. You know, if the players play well, the team plays well, you can't do any better than that. A rematch with the Canadiens in 1973 brought more drama and excitement to Chicago. Pitt Martin's hat trick in game six at the stadium enchanted Hawks fans, despite a Montreal victory to take the series. You know, we had such great years, and it was so much fun. You really have nothing to regret. You know, sure, you, you would like to have won the Stanley Cup, but we didn't do it, so we accept that. But we had great, great years. The 73 season marked the end of an era for the Hawks, who would not return to the finals for 19 years. Today, the stadium salutes its past heroes high above the ice surface. The numbers of Hull, Makita, Hall, and Esposito remind Hawks fans of the greatness they brought to the game. by Joe Murphy, back over the Penguin line. Dropped it back, here's Roenick to the far dot, cutting in to the back end, shoots, he scores! Jeremy Roenick! All our people, I mean, God bless them to a man. I mean, there's no gold brick. I mean, they give you honest hockey. And I don't know if we're gonna win or lose, but I'll tell you one thing, I mean, we play to win and, and try our hardest, and I think that's what the fans are interested in. In a new generation of the National Hockey League, Blackhawk fans hold a passion for the game unequaled anywhere. And it is in Chicago Stadium where that spirit still shines. I mean, there's no place in the world like Chicago Stadium. Uh, he's been around the world and played in all sorts of places. And all I know is Wayne Gretzky last summer, who's been everywhere, said there is no place like Chicago Stadium. So that pretty well says it all. It was in the stadium where Dennis Savard scored 107 points in 1973-74.